Welcome to Zeitcast, the Australian Zeitgeist Movement podcast, where ideas are critically examined and solutions are explored. Founded in 2008, the Zeitgeist Movement is a sustainability organisation which conducts community-based activism and awareness actions through a network of global and regional chapters, project teams, annual events, media and charity work. The movement's principal focus includes the recognition that the majority of social problems that plague the human species at this time are not the sole result of institutional corruption, absolute scarcity, a political policy, a flaw of human nature, or any other commonly held assumptions. Rather, the movement recognizes that issues such as poverty, corruption, pollution, homelessness, war, starvation, and the like appear to be symptoms born out of an outdated social structure. While community support is of interest to the movement, the defining goal is a new model based upon responsible resource management using the scientific method. We call this a natural law resource-based economy, or NLRBE, commonly known as an RBE. This is about taking a direct technical approach to social management as opposed to using money. It is about updating society to the most advanced methods known, leaving behind the damaging consequences generated by our current system of monetary exchange, profit, business and other structural and motivational issues. The movement is loyal to a train of thought, not figures or institutions. The view held is that through the use of research and tested understandings in science and technology, we are now able to logically arrive at conclusions that could be profoundly more effective in meeting the needs of the human population. There is little reason to assume war, poverty, most crime and many other monetarily based scarcity effects common in our current model cannot be resolved over time. The range of the movement's activism and awareness campaigns extend from short to long term with methods based explicitly on non-violent methods of communication. The Zeitgeist Movement has no allegiance to any country or traditional political platforms. It views the world as a single system and the human species as a single family and recognizes that all countries must disarm and learn to share resources and ideas if we expect to survive in the long run. Hence, the solutions arrived at and promoted are in the interest to help everyone on earth, not just a select group. The views expressed on the podcast are not necessarily shared by the Zeitgeist Movement train of thought, but are the responsibility of the individual stating them. Enjoy the show. <laughs> Who's starting? Hello everyone, my <laughs> name's Zach and this is the Zeitgeist Movement Podcast. Hi, I'm Casey. Um, I'm part of the Zeitgeist Movement Australia as well. How did you find out about the Zeitgeist Movement, Casey? I found out years ago. I actually watched the Zeitgeist um, movie in 2007. Okay. That um, that Peter Joseph created. I <laughs> found out about it while I was on holiday in Canada, and my cousin mm-hmm. showed me the very first Zeitgeist Movement, first Zeitgeist movie. Excuse me. And then I really got into it. I saw Zeitgeist Addendum and really identified with the ideas. Mm. And it was the one film, in my opinion, Mm. that put all the problems together and actually recognized that it is a systemic problem, Mm. that the money creation and corporations and the incentive of Mm. the society itself is actually counter to what we want to happen and that no problems can really be solved if we don't fix the systemic problem that is the money market system. Mm. What about you? Yeah, well, it's interesting that you were talking about how you watched Addendum after uh, Zeitgeist the movie, and I know there was a a couple of... Was it only a year gap between those two movies? And I I remember that the first movie really affected me, I think, on on such a deep level that it wasn't even... I mean, I've always been concerned about the way things are in the world, about poverty, about Mm. hunger, about inequality in general. But I always, uh, I guess I had these very narrow visions of what that meant, of what I could do about that. And I had these ideas of, well, I'll become a teacher then. Mm. And how to actually solve those problems. Because you look at each mm. problem as an individual problem. You go, there are people starving in Africa, we need to get them food. And then the education system sucks and we need to fix that somehow. And you realize that it's actually... All symptoms of a singular problem. Yeah, that's right. And that was what the big eye-opener was for me. You know, 
blew my mind, basically. And even, um, you know, the in, uh, religious indoctrination from mm. the first movie, that really blew my mind as well. And it was funny because after that movie, um, I actually discovered um, the Venus Project, Jacques oh. Fresco's work. I discovered that before I watched Zeitgeist Addendum. So it was actually really interesting mm. when I watched Zeitgeist Addendum and it um, focused on, you know, a resource-based economy. And so all of a sudden all these ideas were really fitting together. Yeah. Well, I was very indoctrinated into the capitalism mindset, but mm. not the religious mindset. Yeah. So when I f- first saw Zeitgeist, the movie, and the first part kind of talks about religion as its tool to control people. <laughs> that was kind of like the... T- <laughs> yeah, it was very interesting to me because I'd never yeah. heard it that simply. And yeah. just, oh, Christianity, it's probably fabricated yeah. most, like most other yeah. religions. But then I was also, at the time, very like pro-capitalist right. and everything. And that... Yeah made me reevaluate my worldview and hmm, maybe everyone just fighting for their own benefit and fighting for money isn't necessarily the best way to have a better planet and meet everyone's needs. Yeah. Were you a vegan back then? No, I wasn't. I became vegan about four or five years ago. And, and was this after kind of discovering um, a lot more things about the world and... This was actually by accident when I was going to go to a Zakai's movement meeting and I accidentally went to an Earth Day meeting or something. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> and um, they were showing a presentation by Dr. Michael Greger, who has a very good website called nutritionfacts.org. And what he does is he just reviews the most groundbreaking and interesting scientific literature on in the field of nutrition. And he never said you know, veganism is healthy or anything. He just showed you study by study the effects of meat and the effects of vegetables and legumes and nuts and so on. And the it becomes pretty clear that, oh yeah, meat tends to increase your chance of cancer, increase your chance of heart disease, your chance of diabetes, and vegetables and fruit and nuts and beans and grains and so on tend to reduce it. So it becomes a pretty self-evident... Um, logical decision at that point for me. So your initial reason for becoming vegan was more to do with health rather than the yeah. ethical side. It was 100% health. I didn't care about all the other stuff but at that time. But do you time. feel like that kind of backs up your um, your choice to be a vegan as well now? It does now because veganism causes the least environmental impact on the planet and it also doesn't require animals to be killed. So on that level, I think it's also in line with the Zika movement's uh, goals and aims of not doing harm to others and being most sustainable. Yeah, and, <clears throat> you know, after watching Cowspiracy on the weekend at our, um, our monthly event, Monthly yeah. Movies That Matter, um, which is on the second Saturday of every month at 1.30pm at the Brisbane Square Library, after, after watching Cowspiracy, you know, I've been a vegetarian for about two years now, um, but this actually really influenced me to start thinking more about um, becoming a vegan, so so transitioning towards that lifestyle as well. Um, I think not just because of the animal cruelty, and that was where the angle I came from. I mean, the health, sure, but I think the, the animal ethics is really my, my take on why I've decided to be a vegetarian. And mm. now when I see not just the animal cruelty, but also the huge amount of biodiversity of species being destroyed every single day because of them, because of the land clearing Mm. caused by agriculture, you know, which is way more than palm oil or any of the other practices. Fracking. Yeah, fracking, any other fossil fuel industry. It really makes me rethink, if I decide to eat a piece of chicken, is that worse than me having a glass of milk? And the reality is... No. No. <laughs> so I think uh, for me, I, I mean, this is a new thing for me, I, only since the weekend, um, that I think that going this direction is probably a good idea. I think if you have an organization which is about sustainability, and which is what the Zeitgeist Movement is about, it kind of is implied that all your actions have to be as environmentally friendly as possible. So recycling and 
driving an ecologically friendly car and making (laughs) yeah or not driving car just causing the minimum impact you can and Mm -hmm. the factor that causes the most environmental damage is your diet and is eating meat so that's Mm -hmm. in my opinion a very important thing to address Mm -hmm. because it is a huge factor and it's one that's often overlooked yeah i mean looking on the other side of things here i think we need to kind of look at the other side both zach and i are you know vegan vegetarian if we were to look at it from a meat eater perspective and we do have plenty of meat eaters who um, are advocates of the zeitgeist movement and i guess what it comes down to who and this is what i wanted to kind of address today as well is Mm -hmm. where does the responsibility lie and because we are if you look at any of gabe mate's stuff um, who speaks a lot about addiction Mm. and um, how there's so many different types of addiction, not just drug addiction, but you can be addicted to shopping, you can be addicted to sex, yeah. you can be addicted to food. And I think that even if we just look at it on a behavioral level, to have such high expectations from people that are brought up in this culture that is so difficult to deal with a lot of the time, maybe is a little bit, uh, I guess, a high expectation of people. It is quite judgmental to expect everyone to do it because food is a major pleasure in people's lives and not everyone can give that up. Yeah. That's what Robert Sapolsky talks about. He has a very good lecture series about human behavioral biology and he goes through in lots and lots of steps like what is the evolution that caused our behavior? What is the endocrinology? What is the nervous impulses? What is the environment uh, prenatal, postnatal, etc., etc.? And... Our behavior is formed by a lot of different things, so you can't just order someone to do a certain thing. And that's why I think it does take a change in consciousness and a change in behavior of everyone to actually change the planet. And I don't think that's reasonable to expect in a short period of time. It takes a long time for old habits to die out and new habits to develop. Yeah, and the way we communicate these ideas. So if we go out there saying, you know, if you're not a vegan you're a murderer, <laughs> you know, or something like that, then, I mean, you're not going to see the behaviors you want. You're not going to um, get your message across or have the effect you or maybe on some people. But It I wouldn't think, work on me. No. Like, before, I always respected vegetarians and everything, but I never actually believed I could do it or I would do it. It yeah. was never even in my mind before I actually did. Yeah. So what do you think is the angle that we should come at um, if we do want to kind of change to this new train of thought, do we hold the consumer responsible? No, because I think on some level the consumer is the victim. I think people are victims mm-hmm. of their environment. Yeah. So I think holding someone uh, responsible for, say, a drug addiction mm-hmm. is not really fair if they were abused as a child. Like, you can't hold everyone to the same standards because everyone has slight different biology, but mainly different environment. Different upbringing and different experiences and experience trauma in a way that they can't deal with, and um, which has changed the biology of their brain. Yeah, epigenetic yeah. effect. Because mm-hmm. I have lived an extremely privileged, privileged life. I live in Australia, 21st century, white male. I've had Doing really, life. <laughs> I have very loving parents. I have a great family, great friends. And, um, so I have really no place to point to other people and yeah, condemn but, them. Look, you say that, but at the same time, you still experience things in your life that probably weren't helpful for you. Sure. And which could lead to other behavior that mm. you would otherwise prefer not to do. So I still think even, if you look at it on a relative scale, yeah, okay, you're privileged. But if you just think about the culture that you live in in general, mm. there's still many things that you've had to do and many experiences that you've had that aren't helpful for your future, right? Well, I was lucky I made it out of the school system with some shred of myself <laughs> intact. But most people's soul gets crushed yeah. in the 12 or 13 years of schooling and then they go through life and they always have this next goal but it's not really their own goal. It's do well in high school so you can get into university, do well in university so you can get a good job, get a good job so you can make money so you can buy a house, blah, blah, blah and then you're dead and you have a huge debt and mortgage and it's just pointless. 
Yeah, well, I mean, coming from an education background as a mm. school teacher, um, I have... I guess it's been really difficult for me because as somebody who understands what the education system is trying to achieve, which is not to create critical thinkers and no. innovation. <laughs> it's meant to indoctrinate people. Yeah. Um, it, it, it has been a difficult journey for me as a teacher because, like I said, I became a teacher before I really understood um, what the Zeitgeist Movement's train of thought was all about because I was looking at very isolated mm. you know, ways of solving problems. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean that I've turned away from teaching. I still love teaching, but I definitely see a lot of problems with the institution. And as a teacher, I still need to kind of uh, submit to those ideas. Yeah. And a lot Again, of the time... Again, another instance of you being a victim of the environment. You're kind of forced into this yeah. structure that produces a certain type of person, and that is actually the desired outcome. School systems are not failing. School systems are churning out what the system wants. Yeah. One example, I had a class of eight to nine-year-olds and the principal said something on assembly one day, something like, um, you should always listen to the leaders. You should always listen to um, those in authority because they know best. They have more experience and they know more. And I was sitting there just like... That's terrible advice. <laughs> <laughs> clutching my teeth and watching these children nodding their heads and everything. I'm like, can't anybody else see what is happening right now? And no, because all of them are sitting there looking at this. Uh, they're all part of it. And I felt so isolated and weird. But I took the students back to the class and before teaching them any lesson... I felt like I was this rebel and I, <laughs> I sat them in this circle on the ground mm. and I said, okay, kids, what the principal was talking about before, uh, basically tell me what you think of that. And, you know, they all thought they were being good children saying, well, he said that we should listen to our parents and we should listen to the teachers and, you know, that would be being a good child. And then I said uh, something like, well, what if they were telling you to, um, to hurt somebody? or to mm. jump off a cliff, would you listen then? Mm. And then I said, you need to think critically about everyone you listen to. Yeah. So Think for yourself. Yeah, which was a dangerous thing for me to do. Mm. I could have lost my job. Exactly, because you're not fitting into the system. Yeah, but I still felt proud. I'm glad I did it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like George Carlin yeah. said, you know, respect has to be earned and not every parent deserves respect. No. Some and parents suck. teacher. And not every teacher either. Yeah. So James Phillips, who is one of the coordinators in London, he recently did a podcast for the Zeitgeist Movement. Um, you can find it on Zeitgeist Global. Um, I think it's Zeitgeist TZN official, official channel. chapter. Yep. Yeah, official channel. Sorry. And uh, he was talking about how he's been visiting schools like uh, Summer Hill, I think. Summer Hill, Summer Hill School. I'm not familiar with this, so... Uh, yeah, no, that's okay. So, uh, Summer Hill is basically like an alternative education school. Um, and basically, they don't... Students choose to attend whatever class they like. Mm. Um, they choose the rules of the school. And if they don't feel like coming, they don't feel like doing anything, then there is no pressure there. They, it's basically like learning for yourself. You yeah, self-guided learning. That's the word. Thank you. That's the way yeah. I learn the best. I don't yeah. learn very well with structured, like, here's what you need to learn now. You have two months to learn it. I just yeah. have various interests. Mm -hmm. Whatever I'm interested at the time, I'll kind of mm -hmm. study that. I'll study that until I feel I have a good knowledge of it. And then I'll kind of get bored with that topic and I'll move to another one. And I just keep doing that and I keep learning about various different topics. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most organic and best way to learn because you don't feel pressured into learning and you don't ever be resentful because everything you're learning is you're doing it because you want to. So I think the job of the educator mm. is to inspire them yeah. to want to learn things that are important. And interest. And encourage their interest. But that's really hard sometimes mm. because sometimes maths is just not fun. Yeah. The, rea the reality is you take a five-year-old, some kids love it. They'll love I know, it. playing with their counters and things like that, but some people just don't. They just don't love maths. They hate maths. And you get kids sitting there and you've got the little counters or whatever in front of them and you're saying to them, there's two counters there and there's two counters there. How many counters is that? 
Mm. And all they are doing is looking outside and thinking about how much they want to play. And you've been working with this kid Well, maybe they should play. Maybe, but then th- this is my concern. Look, I yeah. love the idea of self-guided learning, but I see... Oh, there's certainly it. flaws because yeah. people might not learn anything if they're not inspired to learn. So that's yes. what the job of the educator is to me, mm. is inspire the children to want to learn about things. And that you can do that by having the idols in your society be educators mm. and intelligent people, yes. not... Who are the idols of this society? So when because you, that's who people yeah. look up to, and that's who you want to be like. Yeah, true. And so when you are teaching that kid two plus two, you need to show them why that's important and why that's a good thing to know. But sometimes it's hard to know that mm. when you're young. And even if you try to explain why that's important and why they want to learn that skill, it might not be apparent to them until uh, you know three or four years down the track. So sometimes I just wonder, do you just have to force them? You have to say, sit down and learn um, because later on you, you well, know, you want to be Well, some level of discipline or boundaries mm-hmm. is required, I think, but nowhere near to the degree that it is used today. Like the structure of you go to school for five days a week, nine to three, yeah, absolutely. sit at the desk, stare at a board, <laughs> the guys writing on the thing. I don't think that's a very efficient way of learning. No, it's not efficient and it doesn't inspire critical Thanks. Yeah. As well. Yeah. So I think that this, because I hang out with a lot of people that are in these really alternative communities, and sometimes they have really idealistic visions of mm. what education should be. And a lot of them have never been in a school and understand that. So you get these people who create these alternative education systems, and then they're still within a boundary like Mm. a physical boundary, which means they can't leave a particular classroom or they can't leave the confines of the school, Mm. which means that already you have rules in place where Mm. they don't have free will, where they're told that they have to, you know. Because my structure of learning is not necessarily go to a classroom, Mm. watch. Everyone in the classroom is at a different point and moving at a different speed. So that's why I like the internet because you can go find a lecture that you're interested in and at any time you can pause, rewind, watch the whole thing if you want. It's up to you. Like it's a really effective way of learning in my opinion. And then you can learn about anything you're interested in. And eventually I think you will get interested in maths because maths is related to everything. But what, what if it's too late by then? You can always learn. Like if you're learning other things, you can always... You when know, it comes to the- basics, I don't know. Like learning your times tables. Well, sure, yeah. So if you don't learn that from a young age, I think that can be really frustrating for someone who's older to to try Mm. and learn those off by heart. Well, that is a good point because I was... I loved maths as a kid. I hated English, loved maths. So I can't necessarily relate to that point. What if um, what if you turn it around then and think about learning English and the English skills that you have, even the vocabulary you have right now to do this podcast? Yeah. How did you how did you develop that? I mean, of course, you've developed it since high school. Well, yeah, I'm a audio learner, so listening to other people talk is my most effective way. So I'd rather listen to an audio book than read a book. Mm-hmm. But maths is everywhere in our society, and communication in English is everywhere in this society. So. You have to learn it. You learn it by default. So even if you're not explicitly learning it at school at a certain age, because I was a very slow uh, person to start reading and other things. Mm -hmm. Bad writing, still have terrible handwriting. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I can totally function. Yeah, and was that... Do you think that that would have been achieved if some teacher hadn't have sat you down and said, you are not playing outside... You need to write this. Not sure, but that is a good point mm. because it could be either way. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I'm not saying that that's what I believe. I'm just saying that I'm not 100% sure about the whole idea of this really idealistic view of self guided learning. I think that once you're an adult and yeah. you know how to learn, you've been taught how to learn, uh, you know, it's, it's not, way more effective to do yeah, it self guided. Yeah, but if you're a child and you've never really been taught how to research, or how to ask questions, or um, you know where to find the best information. Mm. Then I think that can be dangerous. Not uh, not only absolutely ineffective. Yeah. Think about kids today. Like most kids like video games, mm. right? And not like school. 
That's because, in my opinion, school has been designed to be boring and turn people off learning. And video games have all these tools and mechanisms built into them that make them exciting. The constant yeah. reward system, the constant live action. It's So if you use those same kind of ideas and tools to make learning fun, yeah. I think most people would do it. I think everyone would do it. I think the Khan Academy tries something like that, or does something like that. I shouldn't say tries. Um, <laughs> uh, where they talk about um, like a reward system and that they make learning a game. So, mm. I mean, don't quite... Because humans love games. Yeah, yeah. So even once you learn a particular skill, then you go up a level or something like that and you get these particular rewards. I think what James Phillips is doing is really cool, going into different schools and kind of figuring out how they how they teach and what their philosophy is. And he talked about how would we want a school if mm. we were going to start one as the Zeitgeist Movement. Because you are a uh, teacher, I would probably ask you more than anyone else, what do you envision as being a much better, not necessarily ideal, mm. education system for kids, young kids? It's a really hard question. Yeah, I and know. this is why I was this is why I was um, I guess wondering about this idea of alternative education and all mm. these I- idealistic visions of, you know, self-guided learning and everything like that. And of course I would want there to be more self-guided learning, but I think with children it is young children it's really difficult if they don't have the skills, which they don't. No one has that initially. Mm. The skills, the critical thinking skills. Um, you know, the the ability to think, uh, t- to research mm. thoroughly and to find the correct people to listen to. And I guess an open environment is important, but an extremely supportive environment is also important. Mm. Um, I think being around people that understand critical thought and don't see themselves as an authority, but as somebody that can support them along the way that they respect. Yeah. I think is a is a better way to do it. And what do you think about the topics that are taught now and the mm. topics that are not taught? Because <laughs> you'll notice we learn English and maths and yeah. science. <laughs> science. <laughs> and history yeah. and geography and all that stuff, but we never yeah. learn about the law system that we're governed by because mm-hmm. it's designed to oppress us. Yeah. We never learn about food because mm-hmm. that's a horrific story in and of itself. We never learn about um, how to do a resume, how to fill out a tax form, how to keep a house tidy, how to live a meaningful life, how to not harm others. We don't learn about anything important. Important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the interesting one that you brought up there was um, how to live a happy life. Is that what you said? Something like that. Something like that. But religion teaches you that, maybe? Oh! <laughs> it does it? I'm not sure. I'm not so convinced it does. It might actually um, be a negative impact. Yeah. I mean, I think that a lot of, I guess, religious institutions think that they teach people how to live a happy life, but I haven't had that experience in school. I think they give people a reason to pray and hold on to an ideology and that can give you some emotional Mm. help I guess but I don't think it's necessarily effective to trick people into believing something especially when you indoctrinate people into religion from childhood and you make them feel guilty for natural things like you've sinned for no reason well, you make them believe in a God that is an absolute authority that reads your thoughts, mm. um, that created the world and created you with sin. I mean, I guess I'm talking about Christianity here, but yeah. whatever. But a religion. That's, that's, um, and that kind of contradicts anything to do with thinking for yourself yeah. or thinking critically. Because it presents a closed worldview. The Bible mm-hmm. doesn't get constantly updated with the new scientific breakthroughs every year. Yeah. And so, therefore, I don't think that religion is a good way to teach someone how to have a happy life. I think the things that we can do are, like the things I said, teach them how to be critical thinkers, but also teach them how to have a good relationship with somebody, Mm. how to be a good listener, how to communicate well with somebody, how to solve conflicts. Mm. 
those are the the types of things that you can do. How to be tolerant and resilient. Mm, and cope. Yeah, and I know that there are um, strategies that they're bringing into schools where teachers are meant to teach these things. Um, you know, you talk to students about how to cope with bullying and, and that we do all these team building exercises, you know, like there's ones where, you know, someone falls backwards and someone tries to catch them and oh, all that, kind of, <laughs> <laughs> all that kind of, stuff. I think it's valuable. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But I think that it's, it's not the worst thing in the world. No. I mean, out of all the things that are in schools, it's still, it's, uh, you know, the kids usually love that kind of stuff, mm. especially with this new curriculum. They expect teachers to, to teach more, I mean, we are expected to teach two hours of English a day. Yeah. And then one hour is dedicated to maths. And then you've got one hour left for everything else, which is a lot of stuff. <laughs> and um, and so this program, I, I found in most schools it works like this. The principal says, is everybody implementing the program or whatever the program is? And everyone's like, yeah, 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 for sure. And then they stick a poster on their wall and they never do it. Because they're under so much pressure. From it's designed to fail, though, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. All those kind of programs, mm -hmm. they're not actually designed to stop bullying or... They're designed to make it seem like we're dealing with the problem. Right? Yes, when exactly. When they're not actually... That's right. They're saying, yes, we have it under yeah. control. Yeah. We're dealing with this problem, but not really. Yeah, exactly. So they can just say, when everyone says, oh my God, my kid is out of control, like he can't communicate, he's bullying the other kids, they can be like, well, we're implementing the program, so we're okay. <laughs> but that kind of approach is used for a lot of parts of society, not just schools. Mm. Like the, yes, it's under control, we're on that problem kind of thing when they're never mm. addressing the root cause of the problem. Yeah. Like, yeah, we're going to deal with homelessness and poverty, we're set up a foundation, we're going <laughs> to yeah. spend, we're going to... And you go, yeah, but you're not actually addressing the social inequality that is causing the problem. Yeah, and I, I actually, this is, brings us to a new topic, is uh, charities. I'm actually not a big fan of charities. Yeah, I think most people in the Zeitgeist movement aren't really, because it's still looking at it quite... Well, it's within the system, in a, in it's isolated. in the box. Yeah. In and the box approach is not something I'm interested in personally. Yeah. I don't speak on behalf of the Zeitgeist movement. I can only speak on behalf of myself, mm -hmm. but a charity that you give $30 a month to and they allegedly give that to a kid in mm -hmm. Africa and you feel good inside because that kid has food and water for the month, I think that's a nice idea and if that was actually happening, that would be good, but I'm not sure that's actually happening. I think the company that you're giving the money to, or charity, mm -hmm. is taking the majority of the money and it's probably not... I don't think the money or effort or whatever is ever reaching those people that actually need the help? Well, I used to work for World Vision. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> for a little while. And um, I was selling the child sponsorship there. So, um, I, I mean, I, I believe that a lot of them, from what I was taught after becoming a salesperson for them, mm -hmm. that a lot of the money does go to those families. But the way it works, um, they have to be really careful because a child – cannot receive that money on its own. It has to go to the village. So they say it's child sponsorship, but mm. really what you're doing is just putting your money into a pool and then they're delegating that money mm. uh, to all the various villages and whatever else that they're trying to help. Don't get me wrong. I think they have honorable intentions. I think mm. they're actually trying, but I don't think they understand the intricate nature of the problem itself yes, to be exactly. able to solve it with the yeah. tools that they're using. It's a it's putting a Band-Aid on it. Yeah. And my biggest problem with charities, and don't get me wrong, look, I think that people who are involved in charities, who go over and do all this awesome work, who work for the Red Cross, and you know, they save people's lives. They save people. They save people. It's necessary, and it it's, helps a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But so it's not going to solve any that's problems. That's right. And I just, I just want to back that up before I say what I'm going to say. Um, it is just putting a Band-Aid on an enormous open wound. Mm. And... Basically, when somebody who is very caught up in the system that we live in is emotionally affected by seeing a starving child on TV, so they say, well, I can't do much, but what I can do is give $30 a month to World Vision or whoever, and now I am guilt-free, mm. and I can just live my life however I want. That's my biggest problem, yeah. is that what it the does... The buying the guilt, because that's yes. what the companies. 
buying Sorry, the guilt. The, no, no, that's okay. Charities are ultimately <laughs> selling. Like everything yeah. at the moment is become a business. Yeah. So schools sell education, mm. companies sell products, mm. and charities sell Sponsor. free guilt. Yeah, and it's not just that um, they're buying people's guilt, but people also feel that they don't have the responsibility anymore. They mm. don't need to do anything. That is a huge problem in this society, in my opinion. And yeah. one of the reasons why we're in such a bad way mm. is because people generally don't take responsibility for their actions. Mm. And that's because people are being taught and encouraged not to take responsibility for their actions. But that can lead to some huge problems. And to go back to the veganism thing, I think if people realize what is being done on their behalf for them to eat meat every day or every other day, they would reconsider. Yeah, I think so too. And if they really cared about the future of their children, <laughs> or the future generations... I think most people do, but yeah. they don't necessarily join the dots of how yeah. their actions are affecting the planet and then how the planet is going to affect their children. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people feel like it's just too much to deal with and just want to go back to their simple little lives. And Well, that's what one of the main themes of Cowspiracy was. It was that... All these charities and so on are trying to fix pollution and global warming and everything, but they're mm. dancing around the main issue, which is livestock raising accounts for, according to the movie, 51% of the environmental damage. Yeah, it's mental. So, mm -hmm. and that is something that they don't want to address because mm. if they actually told people, you have to take responsibility for your actions, mm. you need to stop eating meat and eat more vegetables and grains and legumes. People don't want to hear that because that actually requires them to do something. And they'll stop receiving funding. Yeah. <laughs> um, on another topic, I wanted to kind of talk about communities today, sustainable sure. communities, and um, the idea of going off grid, I guess moving somewhere remote with a bunch of people and living like pretty much a zero emissions lifestyle. Mm. I'm actually not a huge fan of that. Why is that? Well, I don't think that addresses the systemic problem. You're kind of running away from the problem. Mm. And if you actually became successful, yeah. then you would get shut down by the establishment institutions. Mm, right. So, But yeah. I think it's a nice idea. Yeah. And I think a lot of people um, that I've talked to who are usually new to the Zeitgeist Movement and new to understanding a resource-based economy, it's, it's a really funny thing because I've watched so many people go through this and you start off like so excited and you're like, oh my God, we've got a solution now. We're going to do this. And then they're, they're like, you know what? We're going to go and buy a block of land and we're going to start our own resource-based economy. Yeah. I don't think that will ever work. <laughs> and well, there's so many people who've tried to do this and it's failed miserably. Well, the thing is you need and rely on so many other human yeah. beings and so many other parts of the world yeah. to live the way you do now and the resources. that it seems like you would be going down in lifestyle and that's not something people are willing to accept. When really technology frees you and should increase your standard of living, mm -hmm. how are you going to afford you know, a 3D printer and all this stuff for a tiny community of 15 people or something? I don't think it's practical. Yeah, and you know, if you have to spend every day shoveling cow shit or spend every day milking the cow or whatever it is, then you don't really have the time to, to work on innovative ideas because, it, you know, if you go back to that lifestyle where you're, you basically don't have the technology you need, then you have to go back to this really simple way of life. And, I mean, I don't really know how helpful that can be either. You also, you have to make a sacrifice and that's yeah. something hard. That's not a gradient people will gravitate mm -hmm. towards. People will gravitate towards something that's easier. Yeah, of course. So yeah. I think, in my opinion, if a resource-based economy type economy ever emerges, it will probably be from the ashes of this economy. Yeah, which is a scary reality, but <laughs> I yeah. think that is the reality. And Because yeah. I don't think the people who control this society are willing to give up their control. Yeah. So and I don't I, think they have... Yeah. They might benefit if there was a resource-based economy already established, but they would have to give up power to actually go there, and I don't think they're willing to do that. Yeah, and just on what you're saying, that um, people don't want things to be easier, not harder, and there might be people listening to this who would say, no, I would give up everything to go to this sustainable community. Um, you know, but there's no guarantees you'll make it. That's but the thing. E even if you do, maybe you're one of those people that, 
that really can do that and is so passionate about it. But the majority of people aren't. The reality mm. is you have to look at how most people think and the, the highest uh, the highest percentage of people would not give up their easy Because lifestyle. I wouldn't. Like yeah. I have a great life here in Brisbane and I wouldn't want to live out in the middle of nowhere with no technology and uh, have to do yard work and everything six yeah. hours a day. That doesn't sound appealing to me. No. Mind you, the Zeitgeist Movement in Brisbane are doing community tours mm. at the moment. Because there are things to learn from these communities about their egalitarian ways and how they are zero emissions or they have uh, community and social values built in mm -hmm. to the community. I think there are valuable things to learn from these communities, so it's still valuable it's, to learn from them, yeah. but not necessarily become another one. Yeah, they've got great, like a lot of them have really great decision-making processes. A lot of them have terrible decision-making <laughs> processes, which is really interesting as well. Um, a lot of them have, um, yeah, that they, they are re they've got really innovative ideas about how to be sustainable and they use a lot of permaculture principles, which are really, you know, really interesting, a new way of, um, of growing. Well, it's not really new, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess uh, a, a different way of growing, growing food. Hmm. But let's say... You know, instead of using first past the post with 50% or first past the post with getting the most votes, use a slightly different voting mechanism. Mm. I don't think that addresses the root problem that people can still be wrong. People can still be biased. And yeah. whether you require 50% of people to approve an idea or 85, it's not mm. going to address mm. the real problem. Yeah. And... I think that also if you are in a community that's quite isolated from the general population, mm. then it can create some kind of strange attitude mm. where people think in the general community, say 100% agree, but these are 100% of people who think a, a particular way that aren't really involved in the reality of the world. So Yeah, people's it, opinion don't matter. People's perception mean nothing to mm -hmm. what reality actually is. That's mm -hmm. why the Zeitgeist Movement advocates science and the scientific method and critical thinking to yeah. actually evaluate ideas mm -hmm. rather than just going, well, the majority of us agree on a certain idea, so that's what we're going to do. No, that's not the most efficient way of doing something. The, com the community we went out to most recently was interesting uh, in that there were some people there who were uh, scientists that lived out yeah. there and they were putting solar panels on people's roofs. And I think that's great. Yeah, they were amazing. And then there were other people who, um, when they found out that we were scientists, <laughs> that most people in the Zeitgeist movement were either scientists or we support science. Um, yeah. That, that sounds like a weird weird way of saying support science. I know. Support science, like that's like a fringe idea. Yeah, well... It's it, like I support, you know, <laughs> I'm pro-life. It's like... <laughs> it's a, well, that's how these people were thinking. I had a few people who, when, I, I don't know what I said. I, I made a general comment and uh, so, something to do with science, I don't know. And then someone said to me, are you a scientist, Casey? And I said... No, but I support science. I don't know. Um, I said I kind of wish I was a scientist. Um, and then basically this was met with um, that I'm not spiritual. What? Um, that, uh, that science has been guilty of so many atrocities like nuclear weapons um, what else? I'm sure I could deconstruct <laughs> that idea. To me, yeah. science is thinking logically. Mm -hmm. What that means is if you think logically, you can find out how nature really is. Like yeah. in uh, discovering mm -hmm. a nuclear weapon, mm -hmm. that's how nature works. And then you as human beings get to choose how to use that tool. Mm -hmm. That's what technology is. It's just a tool. There's nothing inherently evil mm -hmm. with a nuclear weapon, mm -hmm. but you can use a tool badly. Yeah. Or to help people. Well, also listen to, listening to yesterday, um, I think it was, I don't know, I was listening to a, an old Zeitgeist um, panel, like from 2012 or something, and someone on there said, you can use a hammer to bludgeon someone to death, or you can use a hammer to help someone build a house. Yeah. So, you know, it's the same another thing. Technology. Like, Carl Sagan made the same point about rockets that yeah. take us to the planets are the same rockets that... Uh, shoot missiles yeah. around the world. Yeah. So I think that argument that technology is inherently bad yeah. or good is invalid. I think technology is a tool. I'm not sure if we, at the moment, need more tools because that would increase our capacity to hurt ourselves. 
But I think if we became a more educated, logical, critically thinking society, then more tools is good. As long as we, I guess, we still need to have a shared vision that we want there to be less suffering, right? Yeah. Like, that needs to be kind of an over. But I think that philosophy. is a logical thing to come to as well. I but don't think that's necessarily a spiritual thing. I don't know if it is, because I think a lot of people who believe they were logical, like a lot of people who committed mass genocide, <laughs> you know? Yes. like And we've, we've made jokes like this before, like, oh, if everyone was dead, you know, <laughs> then the planet would be saved. And well, that is technically this- true. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. That's what I'm saying. So you're saying logic, right? That, like, if you just think logically, then you'll think more ethically. Well, well let's explain to the audience first, like... No other life on the planet requires humans to exist, but humans require <laughs> lots of other life. And so far, humans in the last decade or yeah. century alone have created a lot of damage to the other planet and causing yeah. the sixth uh, mass extinction on Earth. Yeah. We're probably not necessary to the Earth, but we could... <laughs> <laughs> it's such a ridiculous thing to say. But, I mean, it's true, it's true. But, but we <laughs> could reduce that impact and become another member of nature mm-hmm. and you know just another animal in my opinion if we had a sustainable but that's a real it's still a really scary thing to say because the sudden you say that all i hear is well if we just kill off most people <laughs> and then you know don't overpopulate well, i again. think that's how many it's people genocide who are, and eugenics right there. i think that's how people justify it Yes, I know. And because so, a lot of pe- a lot of this comes down to cognitive dissonance, where you mm. are believing two things that don't go together. Yeah. And you can justify in your mind, well, yeah, we can kill everyone else, but not me, because you know. I'm poor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think that's actually part yeah. of what uh, today's yeah. society is. I think the people in control don't view the rest of us like human beings, just like. Human beings generally don't view animals like other sentient beings. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that goes back to the veganism thing. Yeah, nice segue there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we are back from our commercial break. <laughs> what are we going to advertise in that gap? We need to find something. <laughs> what does the Zeitgeist Movement support in terms of advertising or advocating? Um, I would actually say we do support a few organizations. Like, really? Like profit-making organizations? No, probably non-profit. But things but like... Some- most organizations, or you could say almost all, kind of determined by the profit-making mechanism because it's necessary in this society to make profit or make money to run and expand. It's kind of true, actually. I, I interviewed Douglas Malat who yeah. is a very avid supporter of the Zeitgeist movement. In um, California, right? Uh, I can't remember. Where okay. is he? <laughs> anyway. I, no, no, Florida. I think he's okay. in Florida. Um, yeah, so I interviewed him over Skype at the Future of Food convention that I ran a couple of, well, about a year ago now, I think. And he, so he's the director of Cybernated Farm Systems, which is mm. – um, an organization where they're creating self-sustaining systems that you can put anywhere in the world. So say somebody has been through a natural disaster or something like that and they're a really poor nation and they're all suffering, rather than just throwing a bunch of aid at them, which, you know, doesn't get distributed equally and gets kind of abused and, uh, you know, causes even more corruption, mm. um, you put something there that grows food um, in a, uh, using aquaponics um, and it doesn't matter what environment you put it in. Um, and then that actually provides food for the next generations for like the next 50 years. And mm. it's using like, you know, state of the art technology and so forth. Um, but they were the things going to be used in cities to produce high density food? Um, I don't know if Douglas Miller was involved in that, but okay. it might be similar technology. Right. Um, anyway, he said that his organization is not non for profit. It is, an, it is a for-profit organization. Mm, because to survive, that's the point I was making before, yeah. to survive in this society, you need to make money because everything costs money. Yeah, exactly. And so he was very honest about it and very open about it. And he said, look, I'm not one of these evil dictators who's going to use that money in the wrong way. Like, you know, look at the organizations I support. Look at the kind of person I am and mm. look at what we're doing here. You know, you can go in and say, oh, you're not non-profit 
non for profit. Um, but then actually, I think the people we should be pointing the finger at would be the, the real corporations that are causing the real problems like Monsanto and so forth, not looking at these little guys here are actually trying to do something good. Mm. So anyway, I would say that the well, Zeitgeist movement supports CFS. And fair I would enough. say that we support other things like iFixit. Have you heard of that? I have not. iFixit is another group that um, presented, I, I don't know if it was this year's Z Day or even for Z Day, mm. but um, they presented a website where they, it's basically like a wiki where they're collecting how you can fix your iPhone or how you can fix your computer. Ah, oh, that's cool. Yeah, and you can do it. By yourself at home. So it's kind of open source information to yeah. avoid... Right. To avoid um, adding to landfill, basically. Mm. Yeah. So it's a it's a pretty cool concept, and they presented at um, Z-Day, I think, as well. And then there were a few others. I know that, like, with James Phillips, he started one called TZM Education. Mm-hmm. Um, who else? There, are, There's a lot, actually. There are yeah, a lot fair of enough. different things that You actually do. inadvertently brought up a good point, which is planned obsolescence. Mm. Do you want to explain to the audience how that kind of fits into our <laughs> worldview and what planned obsolescence is? Yeah, and sure. And how it affects sustainability. Okay, so basically when you buy a new piece of technology, such as a phone or a computer or whatever it may be, um, it is designed to only last a certain amount of time. It's not just that the technology is not very good or something like that. It's actually designed to expire at a certain date. This is to keep the economy kind of running. So if your if the technology expires, um, it stops working, then you need to go and buy a new one. So that supports you know the monetary market system. And the problem with that is. This technology just, it's full of like really finite resources and these just go into landfill and are not used anymore. So planned obsolescence, (laughs) planned obsolescence is actually an intentional decreasing of the quality of a product due to the inevitable and unavoidable Mm -hmm. economic forces in capitalism and free market economics. Yeah. So I did, I initially studied uh, business management at the University of Queensland. Yeah. And in the microeconomics course, they were talking about how supply meets demand and everything. They were giving that all big moral yeah. from the beginning. And then they were saying, so let's say you design a computer and it's very good and you sell it for $2,000. Well, you're only hitting one part of the market. So what you could mm. go and do, go into the internal parts of the computer and make it a little bit worse intentionally. Yeah. And then... You could sell for fifteen hundred dollars, and then you could hit two parts of the market. So, do you know that this is actually happening? Would people actually say to you, "This is a conspiracy"? Like, it, but it's not a conspiracy. It's the inevitable, inevitable part of capitalism to cope and to mm-hmm. take up market share. It's yes, but could you use the argument that um, people are just giving us the best technology they possibly have, and it just expires because they haven't quite figured it out yet? I don't think so because I think our state of technology is better than what we actually have. I think if we had the best possible computers and the best possible phones and refrigerators and so on, that they would last longer and be more sturdy than they are. And this is inevitable because you have to minimize cost every time you produce a good because you're competing with everyone else in the market. And if they reduce cost and you don't, and it's just a simple game theory evaluation, then you'll go out of business. So all the businesses that are ethical or that produce goods that last a long time, they are driven to extinction yeah. because they can't survive. Because if you're only if you sell a high quality good and you last for fifty years, say your fridge lasted for fifty years, well you would only buy one fridge. Yeah. And these technologies used to last a lot longer. Yeah. You listen, you listen to older people and they talk about how they had their fridge or stove or whatever it was for 50 years. Mm. So just play in your mind, okay, let's say we wanted to start an ethical technology company and we'd make the best computers and they'd be the cheapest and all that. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't survive because we'd be driven to extinction in the marketplace by other companies undercutting us mm-hmm. and using proven and well-known tactics like planned obsolescence as their advantage. So what do we do about this then? If we have a system (laughs) that basically rewards 
shonky products yeah. that fail. And, and uh, have a short life, so you need to use mm-hmm. more resources to replace them. And punishes people who, or you know, companies that want to develop something that's long-lasting, that's sturdy, that uses the best resources possible, and that doesn't contribute to landfill as often. Um, how do we, how do we stop that from happening? Well, because it's a systemic problem, you need to take away the system. Mm-hmm. But I would say one practical-ish solution is having 3D printers in people's homes or anything. So that would actually be cheaper. And then if they're producing the good for themselves, they don't want a crappy product. They want a good product. So they're going to produce a good product for themselves. But if you're producing a product and you're selling it, who cares? You're selling it to someone else, so it doesn't matter how crap it is. Yeah. You know, I, I just had this idea where I thought about, imagine if you could, you know, 3D print your own phone or whatever. Yeah. And um, You would make it last, so you didn't have to waste more of your own resources, your own money, which is yeah. what it is in this society. Yeah. And that's why open source is so important, mm. because if you patent, um, you know, say... say um, Apple or whoever patents a um, design for a phone and you can go in and buy that design and then print it on your 3D printer or whatever, well, I'm pretty sure that company would still want that to be um, a product that would eventually uh, die, eventually. Yeah, you, you bring up a good point, which is mm-hmm. open source technology. If people mm-hmm. can look at a good and say, hmm, I can make that better, and because of technology, the internet and the fact that files use barely any space Mm. you can improve these designs and share it with everyone in the world because when you copy a idea it doesn't hurt anyone but if you copy a real good then you're taking it away from that person but i can have a file i can give it to casey i still have the file yeah and i i've talked about this before when people say oh can i steal your movies can i steal (laughs) it's like no you can, have. can you can have them because I will still have it. If you if I if you were stealing them off me, mm. that would mean that I wouldn't have them anymore. And that's the difference. Open source or you know intellectual property is not stealing because that means, in my opinion, in my opinion, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, um, because. Because you're not taking it away from somebody. Mm. They still have the original product. Well, think of like how a record store or something would work. In the past, you would make a CD, and that CD, that physical, tangible good, is what has what you want on it. Mm. But now, the CD is not necessary because you can just get the information, which is what you really care about, and in the future, it will be the designs of something. Mm. Because if you just had the designs to build a fridge and you had a big 3D printer in your complex of houses or whatever, and you could just print a fridge, mm-hmm. you print out the best one. And through time, people would improve the technology to where it was or better mm-hmm. that you would have long-lasting fridges and things. Yeah. Because people are producing it themselves and the designs are getting circulated globally and, you know... Getting through improved every, upon. Yeah. Yeah, and... You know, you hear about people who decide to make their products completely open source and you think, is that a dangerous thing to do? Is it dangerous to actually say, well, I've designed this product, I put all my heart into this and now I'm just going to make it freely available for everyone. Therefore, do they not... Well, it's not a good business decision because you're not going to make money. Yeah. (laughs) Which again comes down to the systemic problem that our society is, which is a money market system which rewards corruption, rewards environmental damage. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of curious about that though because I think that a lot of people who have kind of opened up their, you know, their design or whatever it is have actually been quite successful. And, yeah. um, you know, if you think about a YouTube video or something like that and a lot of them get um, a lot of hits on their YouTube video and then they make a lot of money out of that. Mm-hmm. Um, well, YouTube through- is a business as well now. Yeah, yeah, and I guess they they don't ask for money. The people that put the YouTube videos out there, they don't ask for the money themselves. Yeah, well, they get paid by the advertisers on YouTube. So yeah. they're still making income, and usually people who want to do something good for the planet, want to improve the global technology or whatever, mm-hmm. their incentive is generally not money. It's, yeah. I just want enough money so I can do my thing. They want money to not be an issue. Yeah, that's right, so they can just continue making things better making things easier for people and for themselves. Because we actually haven't talked much about what money is. Mm. Maybe we should talk about 
what it is. What do you think money is, Casey? What do I think money is? I think it grows on trees. <laughs> <laughs> money is, is a technology. Money is something that was created by people. Mm-hmm. Does it represent resources or what is Not it? anymore. Mm. The, I think, uh, well, you know, if we talk about the history of money and where it came from, mm. money was used as a means of not having to trade resources directly because it's not practical to trade a cow for some honey directly, having to walk your cow to another village and then maybe that person doesn't want the cow and then you have to walk the cow to somebody else or whatever. So, I mean, that is the most simplistic, yeah. you know, kind of... So you've indicated that it was a form of exchange. Yes, it was. But what do you think it is now? Well, I feel like I have to start with this to (laughs) to build up with that. Okay. Um, Yeah, so it was kind of like a promise, right? Like it's just like getting a piece of paper saying, I owe you this. And Mm. it's kind of a way of measuring something's value. So it relies on trust. Because if someone hands you an IOU, if you don't trust them, it's worthless. But if you do, then it's worth what they say it is. Yeah, that's right. But then that's why you put laws in place and everything like Mm. that. So people get punished if they they don't, yeah, yeah, if they don't fulfill that IOU that Mm. they were meant to fulfill. Um, But now what happened is they changed. Are you talking about when um, Richard Nixon changed the US dollar from being backed by gold to not being backed by gold? Yes, that's right. And it was just, what was it called after that? The petrodollar? Mm, that's not what I was thinking of. Um, Fiat currency? Still not what I was thinking <laughs> of. What they wrote on the actual note, rather than saying that this can be exchanged for gold, it was something like... This, this is, is a Federal Reserve tender. note. This is legal tender. Legal tender, yes. This is now legal tender. Mm. Um, yeah, and so basically it wasn't backed by anything anymore, and mm. um, except for God's hand or something like that, <laughs> which they like to say. I think the function of money in modern society is to alleviate financial restriction because you only have money so that you're not restricted from access to resources mm. because if you have no money then you can't really do anything in this society. But if you have lots of money, then you're not restricted. You can get the best whatever. You can do all the things that technology allows us to do. And in my opinion, the Zeitgeist Movement is kind of like, its aim is to remove that restriction, and then the new restriction would be what nature allows us to do. Yeah, I see. So at the moment, you know, you can only travel and live the life that you would love to live if you have the money. But in the future, if we arrive at the society we describe, then money won't be the thing that restricts you. It will just be our level of technology, which I think is a lot higher than what money restricts us to. Okay. Think of what the life you have to live now. You're restricted yeah. on what you can do yeah. by money, by the economic model, mm-hmm. not by technology. Mm-hmm. Like you could go travel, you could go on a bullet train and do all the things you want, but you have to stay home, go to work, make money, pay your bills. So you're restricted in the way that you can only do what you can afford. But if we had a moneyless society, let's say, hypothetically, and everything was free, everything that cost money today was free. So you could just go and get a fridge Mm -hmm. out of store. You could just, yeah, I'll just fly to Japan. Yeah. You could do anything and you could have, you could live anywhere. There was no Mm -hmm. rent Mm -hmm. and so on. You would live a very different life than you live today. Yeah. Um, and I think people would object to that idea by saying that, well, if you take, if you allow people to just do whatever they like, then they'll abuse that. Mm. But I think if you look at, um, especially the state of the American economy and the fact that there are more homeless people than there are mm. houses that are free, that are empty houses, then, you know, this is just showing how the monetary system isn't supporting the resources that are available. Mm. And if we were to just take that away and then say, okay, um, we're going to think of a really um, great strategy or system that allows everyone, every person here to have a house, Mm. have somewhere to live. Well, it wouldn't be hard for them to do that either. Not really. (laughs) Not with the technology that we have. (laughs) Yeah. And it would be safer for everyone as well, Mm. you know. 
So in your answer, you kind of alluded to people who would criticize my model for the future as, well, people would be greedy, so they would um, yeah. abuse that power. Yeah. That kind of implies that humans are inherently greedy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like where you're going with this. <laughs> All right. Well, do you want to comment? Um, that, yeah. Well, I often get this. And even from people who've, uh, you know, kind of endorsed the ideas of the zeitgeist movement, a lot of them think, oh, yeah, but, you know, humans are just greedy. They're just that's just how we're built. We're meant to be that way. Yeah, self-interest. Because you know, that is pre the prevailing ideology. Yeah. If you live in a money market system that mm -hmm. rewards going out for yourself, competition, greed, yeah. corruption, yeah. then you're going to have someone that endorses those ideologies. Yeah. Whereas if you had a different society that rewarded different things, you would have and someone who And I don't think it's human nature. You know, if you look at human nature, that is... That is not what we are. We are one of the most dependent of all the species. On other human beings. Um, yeah, well, I mean, just uh, others, other species on the planet can actually survive on their own pretty much straight after birth. Mm. Whereas humans are extremely reliant on each other. You know, they mm. say that if you don't hold a baby for the first couple of months, it will die mm. simply because it hasn't been held. And, you know, we're not even born as fully developed Yeah, we're social animals, beings. We need other human contact. Yes, that's right. And if we, you know, which means that we are naturally a collaborative species, not mm. a competitive species. And we naturally need each other and we need to care about each other. If we don't do that, then we can't survive. So this idea that we're inherently greedy, I think only comes from scarcity, mm. the scarcity of resources. And if you are afraid that you're not going to get what you need because you're in a system that can actually do that to you, take away absolutely everything you need to survive, then it creates the opposite. It mm. creates fear. And I think that greed comes from fear. Yeah, fear of the future because humans can perceive the future. And yeah. they, if they foresee a negative outcome, they get afraid. Yeah. And Robert Sapolsky talks a lot about this in his lecture series, mm. about how human behavior is kind of like a gaming strategy and to cooperate mm. is like the best strategy. It mm. drove all the other strategy strategies into extinction. Yeah. And it follows a tit-for-tat kind of layer where mm. if I cooperate with you, you cooperate with me, and so mm. on and so on until someone doesn't cooperate, and then they don't cooperate back, and then... It goes back to cooperating if possible. Yeah. Okay. I haven't seen the Robert Sapolsky series. They're a very good series. Just type in Robert <laughs> yeah. Sapolsky Stanford Lectures yeah. and you'll have 40 hours of amazing material. Yeah. I started watching last night. <laughs> 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 yeah. So that is something that is on my bucket list to do. Yeah. So, that so apparently, according to evolution, that cooperating is the most effective strategy. There's a guy who talks about, I mean, this is within the education system, and he talks about uh, that, that how detrimental competition actually is within schools, hmm. that it's to the point that, um, you know, it actually brings down people's grades and abilities. Yeah, but the governing ideology is that competition is good and a, hmm. competing makes people better their standards and so on. And that's not necessarily true for one reason is that the society that, perpetuate that mm. perpetuates that is the successful people of this society that believes that ideology. Yeah, and that brings me back to Gabor Mate who talks about um, not just the um, addiction, sorry, the power of addiction, but the addiction to power. Mm. Um, and he talks about how these people, this addiction is worse than any other addiction. Yeah. If you're like a, a massive coke head or like, you, you know, whatever it is, and you're like hurting all the people in your life and even if you kill someone, you're still not as bad as someone who is addicted to power because these people will do anything to maintain that, that um, place and they will do it at the... Expense at of the, everyone else yeah, and everything else. Of the environment, of everyone around them. And because they're in a position of power, they can do that to the most people. Mm. So they are the most dangerous of all the addicts. Well, if you believe that, you know, when you die and your actions don't matter and there's no life after death and all that, as I do, <laughs> you could justify that to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't because I don't really think. But okay, here's well, the thing is I can understand how those people think. Yeah. Like you can justify things to yourself if you don't, if you truly believe other people don't matter. Oh, okay. So, what you're saying is that you're as as that they're in denial. 
They're okay. in denial about the effects of their actions. But as an atheist, <laughs> right? I'm, I'm not saying atheist, atheist, I'm saying not believe in, um, yeah, spirituality even. Okay. Like when you die, you, it's done. You're just dead. Yeah, so but they okay, could justify okay. their actions by thinking, the train of logic goes something like, well, I'm making a good life for myself, even if it's hurting lots of other people, and once I'm dead, I'm dead, so it doesn't matter. So, so it's, but this is the point I was going to make. As an atheist, do you believe that other people have thoughts? Yes. Do you believe... Um, Theory of mind. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And what do they call people who believe that everything only exists within their own mind? Uh, s- solops- solopsism? Solopsism, that's what it's okay. called. Okay. Um, and that is, uh, they, they are people who believe that the only thing that they can know... I mean, this is true, that the only thing that we can truly think know that exists is your mind. Yeah. And that everything else around you could be some kind of virtual reality or just not exist at all yeah. and you've just created it all in your mind and that's what these kind of people believe. So I guess your question to me sounds more like if somebody um, thinks this way and thinks their mind is the only true thing, then that could lead them to believing I don't care about um, everyone, about else. everyone else because my mind is the only thing that exists. But that's not the same as thinking as being an atheist because that's just thinking... Um, that, that doesn't mean that you don't believe that other people don't matter. Well, yeah, that's the point I was going to make is atheism and morals are not mutually exclusive. No. You can have athe- you can have morals and be Christian, you can have morals and be atheist, and you can be Christian or atheist and not have morals. Yes. It has really nothing to do with it. <laughs> that's right. There's no overlap. So I think there are actions that are wrong, and they kind of include hurting people, imprisoning people, mm-hmm. turning people into slaves... Causing animals pain uh, mm. and damaging the planet. And after you're gone as well? Well, when I'm gone, I'm gone. I'll have no more input. Yes, but you care about what the future yes, of the people the future. is after, yes. after you're gone as well. And you believe that there will be human beings after your death, if there yeah. are when you die. And, and you can understand how that kind of <laughs> you won't emerged. Be the they were, that kind of emerged from evolution because if you evolved to not care about your kids and the ki- yeah. your kids' world, then your species might die out. Yeah. That's why you want, generally parents want their children to have better lives than they do. Mm-hmm. It's because they want, you know, abstractly, they're not necessarily conscious of this, but they want the species to progress. Mm-hmm. Which seems like a bit of a contradiction right now. Because, why? Um... Well, because of the way the planet's looking and the attitudes of most people Mm. that, you know, here they are reproducing, they love their children dearly, yet they aren't doing anything about the future of our planet. And so... That's a good point. One that I hadn't really considered because I have no theory of mind to actually think about how (laughs) other people perceive the world. Because I generally thought that everyone recognizes that the world is getting worse environmentally and so on. And that that is bad. Like I thought yeah. everyone would have at least have those ideas together, right? I feel as though everyone I talk to, but maybe I'm just in those circles, you know. I hang out with like-minded people, so sometimes I have to be aware of that. Yeah. But, um, like, I generally feel like if I actually get down to the core of it and I ask people, what do you think the state of the world is today? What direction do you think we're heading? They do have very similar thoughts to you and me. I would expect they would because I don't think they're delusional I just think they don't have the right strategy to actually know how to solve the problem. And people go in lots of different directions to try and solve that problem. So they might think that the world is getting worse because of those Democrats. And if we only got and if we only got into office then the world would be getting better. Yeah, that's right. So And they keep justifying whether they're you know, let's say I'll use that example, whether their office is in or not. And things continue to generally get worse all the time. They justify, oh, it's because the Democrats are blocking the thing. And, oh, those Democrats are in. And then, oh, yeah, but the Republicans, they weren't, whatever. Someone who's very close to me in my family. Um, You're not going to name names? (laughs) No, 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 no. Um, Basically said that um, I should stop being an activist because it's too difficult for 
to live that way and just leave it up to those people who are problem solvers and are just going to find the solutions. So I think that's a very uh, <laughs> just dismissive, like yeah. no responsibility for that's my own right. actions that's way right. of looking at the world. But he's thought he wanted me to have a good life and to just, you know, be able to focus on having a nice career and finding a nice partner and like bringing up kids and everything <laughs> like that, and, you know, um, and not have to worry about all these other things. Leave it up to those people. Don't worry about hmm. don't wor- don't worry about you having to do that. And I sometimes think that this is a big problem too. Is yeah. that people think apathy. People yes. believe oh, other people are on this problem. There are definitely people yeah, on this solving it. I don't actually have to do anything. Yeah. It's a way. Apathy is an excuse for yeah. not taking responsibility for your actions. Yeah, that's right. And then even trying to encourage someone else not to worry. Well, that's how they justify it to themselves, I think. I think I, that's, yeah, I think you're if, probably right. uh, if you can justify it to someone else, then you can justify it to yourself. Yeah, so I think that's one more reason. So, so we have some problems in the world, people, and it's apathy. And I yeah, think it's right. environmental. I think it's uh, bred into us from yeah. birth to be apathetic because I don't think humans are generally apathetic. No. I think – but I, I honestly think that if you truly care about the environment, this is my personal opinion, and you truly care about the future of your children, then – then you need to pull your finger out. Yeah, you need to care about the environment. Yeah, do something. But again, this comes back to judging people and not judging people. Yes. And how we are mm-hmm. in, in a way, an experienced, uh, privileged yes. position where yes. we've already made this journey. Yeah. Where not everyone has, mm-hmm. and we can't necessarily empathize with where they are. Absolutely. At. Because yeah. there was That's a, a time for 19 years when I ate meat and I thought nothing of it and I didn't think I was doing anything mm-hmm. wrong. So if I saw myself mm. back wh- who I was, yeah, I would not really like like yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but that's why you change. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I th- I think that about myself too. Um, I actually wanted to go back to. Um, I didn't get to finish your point on the the bonfire at this community I was at, talking about science, and it was really weird because. Um, you know, I was, they brought up the point that, you know, the atom bomb and everything was made by science. And Everything's like, made of science. <laughs> well. A fire. A pair of glasses. <laughs> so the point that I actually made when I was out there that I said three times and it still didn't get across to them was that science is not flawed in that it is it's just a tool that you use to figure out if something works or if something is correct. Scientists, however... Are flawed human beings. Exactly right. Yeah. That's the point that I said three times. And every single time he came back and said, but what about this? What about this in science? What about this? And I said... If it has him, anything to do with this scientist said or this scientist did, yeah. it's not really relevant. No, because, yeah, scientists are to, people. Yeah, you have to address the scientific method, which is what we advocate, not people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that this seems to be a common kind of problem that people have, that they see that there's been some things that scientists have done that are pretty bad. Like, you know, they might do a particular study. You could justify cutting someone's brain out, Yeah, part of their frontal lobe out, because, oh, we a scientist diagnosed they were crazy or depressed. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, that's one thing. And then even because so many of the scientific industries have a profit incentive. And corruption. Yes. Yeah. Then, of course, they're going to produce shonky science. But that doesn't mean that... Or also use science that is functional for yeah. negative things. Yes, exactly. But that doesn't mean that the scientific method itself has any problem mm. and it is the way forward because you can actually I right now you're probably sitting there and think about what your clothes are made of think about if you wear glasses what how was that technology developed or how are you listening to this what about your teeth are your teeth good and what who develops the technology to fix your teeth if you had problems or whatever it is the reason that you're even alive right now could have would have only been through science and if you just Look at that and say, no, I don't believe in science. Well, this kind of segues to, you know, humans in their natural environment. Mm. If we had no science, how would we operate just in nature? I think that's the part of our species that separates us is our intelligence. Yeah. And we can use science to overcome our 
shortcomings is like humans can only carry so much, but we can build machines to carry more than what any yeah. human could. Yeah, sure. And even on um, on an intelligence level, we need to be, what is it? I can't remember the guy who says this, competent enough to know that we're not competent. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I think it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect when you're not competent enough to know that you're not competent or something like that. And so the sudden you recognize that, um, the more likely you can be to develop things that can help you overcome that. And uh, there's physical things we have created to overcome that. But even on um, an information level, a knowledge uh, gathering level, we can create tools now mm. that... Um, outweigh our intelligence. Yeah, and that's why I think technology is necessary to move forward because that has what has given us a better life so far Yeah, is technology. Yeah, that's right. Our life is better because we have access to, easy access to food Mm. and refrigeration and Mm. housing and so on. That's all as a result of technology. Yeah. Do you reckon, though, that we could end up in some kind of like um, dystopian Matrix-style future through technology? I think it's possible, and I kind of think that's the slight trajectory we're on now, (laughs) is that we're becoming a police state with surveillance and so on. What do you think? I think that it's it's just the same as any technology. If you use it incorrectly, or if you if you don't have the um, the right ethics behind you, then then of course we can head to a very we could head to a very dangerous place. Um, and I think this was the other point I wanted to make with my bonfire discussion um, was that, you know, we were talking about how logically you can say that just everyone being dead is probably the best way we can solve all the problems on the planet. But but we need to kind of have a, um, a universal philosophy that says that we want to decrease suffering and that we want to preserve life. Yeah. And I that's was, also part of evolution, wanting your species to survive. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, is that what you want? I yeah, mean, I don't want humans to die out. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, obviously, we probably don't need as many as there are right now. We're probably got a little bit overboard, but I don't know. Um, but yeah, so basically, decreasing suffering, yeah. preserving life is what we want to do on on all levels. And I don't think that comes from science. I don't think that comes from logic. I think that does come from spiritual. Possibly. I mean, depends on your definition of spirit. Yeah, well, that's fair enough. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure it does. I think it actually comes from evolution. You want your species to survive. That's an uh, innate desire. But does science care about us surviving? Like, But that's what we are. We are a link in the chain of evolution. Okay, yeah. So we, we want to survive simply so that life can continue. And... I mean, I don't even understand that from the beginning as, as why things started reproducing and why living things wanted to continue living and why that's so important. I mean, yeah, well, you could argue it's question. not even. You could argue anything like, oh, well, none of this really matters. But, but so, as, as so a So if none of this being, really matters, then why are we trying to fix anything? Just go back <laughs> yeah. to sleep. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. Um, but I guess as a living being, we do have a, I guess, a, a physical need or want, I guess, or desire to yeah. um, to preserve our species, to continue. Yeah, I think that's natural. Live. Yeah, but I still don't know if I explain that on a... And, and I guess, I guess uh, for me, it is a kind of spiritual level, and hmm. I don't want that to be confused. With I believe in spirits. Yes, that's right. Or... Yeah, because <laughs> I don't. I don't believe in spirits. I don't believe in a soul. I don't believe in God. And I, but on, I guess if you were talking about um, the, the spiritual as an atheist could be, um, talking about the fact that we, um, on an atomic level, yeah. are made from stardust, which yep. is what Carl Sagan <laughs> says. And different atoms from different stars in each eyelash. Yeah, basically like all the atoms in our body are made from various different places in the universe. And we are... Basically, we, we aren't just, you know, humans within a universe. We are the universe. We are part of the universe. And we are like the universe because we are this made from the same atomic material yeah. as everything else in the universe. And it's just like... Somehow assembled itself into consciousness yeah. and intelligence. And so we are the universe trying to understand itself. 
And that is like to me so very profound. Well, yeah. More profound than like any kind of like religious philosophy I've ever heard. Hmm. And reality is so much more exciting. And I guess that's what. Yeah, I, I guess say. that's another criticism, which is way more silly of religion, is that it's boring. It's <laughs> it's that <laughs> yeah. reality is way more interesting and exciting than these fairy tales. Yeah, for people to be. When people say to me, oh, you know, it's so cold or it's so like, you know, oh, how can you not believe in anything when I say, when they say you're an atheist, when yeah. I tell them I'm an atheist. Well, most like, people would, I think, misunderstand if you said, because that's what I say, I don't believe in anything. Yeah. People misconstrue what that actually means. Yeah. Maybe they interpret that as you don't have any morals mm -hmm. or something like that, mm -hmm. where someone could misjudge you for that. Yeah, yeah. I definitely think so. Um... Yeah, because I think a lot of people think that morals come from religion. Yeah, which I think is a strange thing <laughs> to think. I think logically that doesn't necessarily make sense. And it the definitely evidence, doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> because if you look at the um, even the New Testament, there's a lot of things in there that you would never agree with right but now. But when you decode what the Bible and so on actually says and advocates, how could you possibly agree with it? It makes no sense. It's Maybe logically we should say some examples. <laughs> Otherwise people will... Not like us very much. <laughs> uh, well, why don't you give some examples? Because I actually haven't read the entire Bible. I haven't read the it's entire really Bible. It's really boring. But you I've don't tried. need to read the entire Bible. You can only, you only need to read bits and pieces to kind of understand, like but, the fact that um, it, it, let's talk about Genesis. I mean, most people know the story of Genesis. Yeah. Right at the beginning, God created everything, and <laughs> and I always think about the logic of this story from the beginning. So so God decides to make everything and then he makes people um just for for shits and giggles basically you know, and he like, looks like he's us born. he's born <laughs> <laughs> so he's just like i'm officially born if you ever watch messed i'll up make these stories. humans that have flaws and then i'll blame them for it yes exactly it's so right stupid. like okay so he creates a perfect being adam and then he puts this tree he puts them in this beautiful garden and then he puts this tree there called the tree of knowledge. And you shall not eat from this tree. And if you eat from this tree, thou shalt surely die. And, <laughs> you know, and then I watched part of this funny YouTube video is Adam says, well, why'd you put it there in the first place? <laughs> what are you trying to do? What's the point? <laughs> why are you sabotaging the people you say you love? Yeah, it doesn't actually make any logical. But any what logical it does sense. is it's a religious story that encourages not wanting knowledge. Yes. If, if it, why is it bad to eat from the book of Tree no of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, because he basically says that you should just listen to me and have faith in me. And yeah, which is, sounds a lot more like a human creation of trying to control people than yeah. a divine spiritual meaning. Yeah, that's right. Okay, message. so the first thing he's done is condone um, killing someone or punishing someone and then killing them. So you can say here, oh, thou shalt not kill. Here is, um, you know, one of the commandments that he makes a lot later on. But before then, killing's fine, you know. <laughs> killing's fine, um, like killing baby children, sacrificing sheep, sacrificing your own children. But then you can justify, oh, well, well people who aren't part of this religion don't count as people, so it's okay to kill them because they're not really people. Yes, that's another thing as well. So, Hence religious wars. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's another thing? So he creates woman from the rib of Adam and then she's the one who actually is the naughty one and eats the apple and so both of them are condemned to a sad life and you know horrible childbirth and you know this is the original sin right like and then what's that say about women as well? Yeah, it says women are inherently sinners or something. Women are made from men, so they're not even like... <laughs> Which is not scientifically true. It's men are made from women. Well, men have nipples. That's all I have to <laughs> yeah, say. Yeah, well, if you have an <laughs> X chromosome and then the second one is an e either yeah. an X or a Y. Yeah, but whatever. Like, <laughs> it doesn't... It, yeah, I don't know. I think it just puts us in a position of being separate from one another instead of all just being, you know, we're all just human beings. And hmm. instead we're... we're Anyway, I feel like I'm getting off topic here. I don't really like it. There is this. no topic. It's me and No, but this is not where I wanted to go with this. I wanted to talk about um, morality in the Bible. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so basically killing. So he says, thou shalt surely die. And then Eve eats the, from the tree of knowledge, and then he doesn't kill them. So he's lied. He's not just... So he doesn't even stand doesn't up to his own them. values. No, he doesn't. He lets them live, and he lets them live painfully. 
These are the first people that he's <laughs> ever made, right? Like, and think about it, okay, <laughs> logically from this standpoint. So there's Adam and Eve, a man and a woman, and then what do they have? A few kids, right? Let's yeah. say they have three or four kids. Then what happens? Their kids breed with each other, like... Right, get the next part. So they have Cain and Abel. They, these are their first children. Um, and then Cain, um, he's jealous of Abel, and he kills Abel. This is the first children. Yeah. Jealousy oh, and yeah, yeah. all these bad emotions already. Yeah, this is already right at the beginning that he kills his brother because his brother is loved more by Adam. Right at the beginning. So <laughs> anyway, let's go down a few generations. And you know, a lot of people say that maybe Cain was the devil's child because um, maybe Eve laid with the snake, you know, the snake that told her, which which God also created. So mm-hmm. God creates this snake and the snake's like, oh, you should eat from the tree of knowledge. And she's so like, why is he All tempting right. you? Yeah, why is he tempting her? And why would God make a snake that intentionally tempts you? Because God made everything, right? So why he would, definitely made this snake. Why would he make temptation? Yeah. And then Why and would he make jealousy? Yeah. Or, and the, or the idea of murder. Like, the idea of murder is pretty strange. The idea yeah. that you are going to take away someone's consciousness yeah. forever. Yeah. I don't think that's something that naturally occurs much to people outside of this society. Yeah. I don't think so either. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, if people have their needs met, yeah. then there's no reason not to cooperate. It's just simple game theory evolution. Mm-hmm. And if you have your needs met as you would in a resource-based economy your emotional needs, your material needs like food and water and shelter, yeah. you would have no reason to not cooperate. Yeah, and then you wouldn't need these nasty story- stories that put people in a state of perpetual fear their whole life where they think that this scary guy who sacrifices, you know, countless people and has done through since the beginning of time, which he apparently also invented, um, is going to is going to punish you. And punish you for things that you think. And As if send thoughts you, are wrong. Like yeah. You can't think about something <laughs> yeah, even. Yeah, yeah. And then send you to a place of eternal suffering. Yeah, for, for something that you did in your yeah. uh, limited life, you get punished yeah. infinitely for. That yeah. seems a little unfair. Yeah, I agree. And so I just... Def- anyway, back to the, the main the thing we are saying here is religion is not about morality. <laughs> and then there might have been a few things in the Bible that, you know, you pick and choose, you pick and choose. And the, you know the reason you pick and choose? It's because, because you're a moral person. Yeah. It has nothing to do with being religious. Yeah. Because you're like, oh, that's actually bad. This is actually good yeah. according to my morals. So you ignore the scripture that talks about unicorns and, you know, killing babies. Or, or has to do with promotes values that are no longer socially acceptable. Yeah, like slavery. Yeah, or stoning people to death. Yeah, yeah. Or crucifixion. Yeah, that's right. And instead you look at the one that says... That promotes um, love and all yeah, that stuff. But yeah. if it promotes something that you perspe- perceive as negative, yeah. then you go, Just oh, know. I'll ignore that. Yeah, that's Which right. is actually showing that religious people, I guess, do have morals. Yeah, of course, <laughs> but they don't get their morals from religion. Yeah. I agree with that. I think humans innately have morals because of a game theory evolution. Yeah. Yeah. And it is beneficial. You pass on more copies of your genes if you are cooperative and moral. So it has nothing to do with religion, in my opinion. Thanks for listening to the first Zeitgeist Australia podcast for 2015. We hope you enjoyed the show. Apologies for the audio quality. We are still working on getting the best possible audio equipment to make the show as clear and listenable as possible. If you'd like to find out more about the Zeitgeist Movement, you can visit www.thezeitgeistmovement.com or visit the Australian website www.zeitgeistaustralia.org. Once again, thanks for your time with us today and we look forward to having you as a listener on our next show.